Welcome back to the Levity Zone. Yours truly, Dr. Bruce, was so chock-a-block in May and June that I couldn't squeeze out time for a podcast. But the good news is that I was busy preparing to give a talk at a very interesting conference, which I bring to you now in two parts. This was the 24th Annual Science of Consciousness Conference, organized by Stuart Hameroff of the University of Arizona. It is a fascinating meeting which brings neurobiologists and psychologists together with meditators and spiritual teachers, all in a quest to understand what makes up and what is encompassed by our conscious experience. I gave an interview to Nick Day of Consciousness Central, which was recently posted on the conference YouTube channel. I bring it to you now as it is a good setup for the plenary talk I gave the very next day. So let us sit down with Nick Day in the studio in La Jolla, California on June 9, 2017 and explore some fresh new ideas emanating from our recently published novel approach to life's origins. Some of these ideas include truly old rocks, a symbiotic start and driver of biology, a tripartite structure that might underlie the conscious experience, and even some implications for physics and philosophy and how we might better steer our civilization, or at least enjoy more time in hot tubs or hot springs. I'd like to welcome to Consciousness Central, Bruce Damer. He's at the Biota Institute at UC Santa Cruz. Welcome, Bruce. Thank, Thank you. you for being Thank with us this much. afternoon. Yeah. Uh, your um, area of research and exploration is evolution, evolution of life, and mm -hmm. with that obviously comes some sense of the evolution of consciousness as well. You're here presenting at the Science of Consciousness Conference. What brings you here? Uh, Stuart Hameroff bring, brunked me here, brought me here. Brunked you there. Uh, brunked me here. <laughs> okay. um, I, last year they had uh, Stuart Kaufman, who works on the origin of life from a theoretical basis, autocatalytic sense and things like that. And this year I'm coming to sort of fill that slot to talk about the actual physical mechanisms of the origin of life um, and how, what that teaches us about all living systems, and then potentially what consciousness is. So it's kind of a big unwinding, because if you unwind life back to its bootstrap, you know, its old computer bootstrap cycle, you can read the code of how life started and how it, how it could have started up within the physical environment and the chemistry, the cycling body, basically. And then that teaches you the properties of all living systems, including where the, what the conscious field is, what it, whatever it is. So that's what I'm doing here tomorrow, is to try to unravel that and present that as a new framework for them. So this is a huge monumental pro, uh, project and uh, um, a, a huge question for us as humans, as living beings on this planet, the mystery of it all. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, uh, one thing I have right here uh, to ground us a little bit, uh, this is it's a sample, rock sample, from the northwest of Australia, and it's one of the best preserved, it's really the oldest best preserved evidence for life on Earth, uh, 3.5 billion years old, and these little red nodules are called stromatolites, and they're biofilms laid down by early microbial communities that cement sand grains together. So this is our common ancestor. This is the unit that led to basically uh, the entire biosphere. Uh, and this is at three and a half billion years ago. The origin possibly was at 4.2, 4.3 billion years ago. That's the era that I work on and there's no rock record. So these are complex little fellows. They're doing photosynthesis, they're doing chemosynthesis, probably thousands of species that, that made these structures. And then about 800 million years later, we find stromatolites at lake shores. So this is uh, what's called lacustrine stromatolite, and these ridges here, those are uh, made by living forms. And this is basically mudstone. You can almost even see it. 
So this is from the Tumbiana, also in Australia, and, and it's just basically a muddy lake shore. And you find a lot of these uh, preserved from the marine seashore. So this is the whole story of life for about 90% of Earth's history. And we, as complex life, are extremely late in the game. Our bodies are almost like microbial mass because our gut bacteria are, are you know, 100 trillion of those versus 13 trillion cells. So we're mostly these biofilms. So the biofilm is the story of life on the planet. Complex life is a temporary interlude, probably 1 or 2% of the history of Earth, and then it'll go away. We're extraordinarily rare. Uh, so consciousness isn't a rare phenomenon, unless you believe consciousness can come out of these. So, so that's one piece of evidence that's come in, that uh, life could have started in, in these uh, hot spring environments or freshwater environments, not in the sea, not in the ocean, back in Darwin's warm little pond. So how does this roll forward, you may be asking. Uh, in I'm, I'm actually curious that how this become, how this is, just very simply, very quickly, how this is identified, how somebody can take a look at this and go, ah, this is the very earliest life forms, and so, so we know this because. <laughs> we know this because what we see are these ridges, and geology can't make a structure like this. These ridges that pile up and, and, and go basically against the slumping forces of gravity. So it's made by active biofilms. And stromatolites still live today. And if you go to the coast of Australia or a number of places in saline environments, you can take old stromatolites and cut them, in, and they look just like this. So these are their great ancestors. How old again? 3.5 billion, 3 .5 years, billion old. years old. I'm on the one-site selection team for the next Mars rover that will be landing in 2020, 2021. And we're arguing or we're debating with NASA to send the rover back to where a hot spring has been found to look for life on Mars there. But that's a little off topic from, okay. from consciousness. <laughs> Maybe not, actually. <laughs> okay. Can we say, as a, is it axiomatic that all things are, are descended from a single moment, a single molecular change that's, in one local place, or is it That's where the new thinking is, the new mm -hmm. thinking. And this, it does impact the study of consciousness. So what we're, what we're intuiting here, and we're starting to see in laboratory testing, is that the origin probably was not a single cell. It wasn't even a single process. It was a network effect. So in ponds that are drying down and wetting, drying down and wetting, that creates a pump action. That creates what's called a three-phase cycle. The, the universe does two-phase cycling. Stars are there, they blow up. Day-night cycles, things like that. The universe never has an intermediate phase, even in the quantum states. But life builds an intermediate phase called bodies that have memory and, and, adapt and adapt and evolve. And you're the intermediate phase between you and your children and your children's children. Right, so in the earliest phase of life, you would have had a drying down pool with simple protocells all clumping together at the bottom, interacting with one another. And it's that matrix that's the sum is, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts that creates the living world. And that goopy matrix actually is a probability machine. It's a probability engine that takes improbable events and makes them probable. It's almost a quantum kind of a thing. It, it takes things that are unlikely to happen in physics and makes them happen. I mean, us sitting here would never happen in physics in the universe, ever. Biology made this happen. So biology is a giant probability machine that makes things probable. And so somehow that property impacts the study of consciousness. Because if we say, for instance, we're doing a study where we, somebody has an intention for something, strong intention, I would like such and such to happen. And it does, but it's highly improbable. So the mystics among us might say there's an intersection of the, of the angels. But if you understand the system of consciousness just as an outgrowth from life that's a probability engine, well, of course, it has a mechanism by which even intention, human intention, affects that system in a way that it, it starts to bring improbable events your way, right? And the stepping stones are presented and such and such because it's the property of all of life. So, so that, that's a sort of discovery uh, of unwinding life to its basic source, what it does, what the trick that it does. It's still the thing that dominates uh, our world. And so that's probably intention and serendipity. 
you know, coincidences are related to that because life also makes connections all over the place. It, it does a big connectome. Physics can't do that. The third thing it does is it creates memory. It creates instructions, genes, books, you know, t TV programs and interviews are, are the memory uh, patternome, if you will. Physics doesn't do patternome, doesn't do linear information. So these three properties form a triangle. This is what I'll present for the first time tomorrow. It's never being presented, this idea that this triangle just continually cycles and it generates this incredibly large field that's called biology or the living world, but it's a field that's much larger than consciousness, much larger, and that a primate, a primate is, is an instrument in the field sensing that field, but only through primate lenses. The, the earthworm will sense it through different lenses and have different objectives, but it will be affected probabilistically, it'll be affected by connections, and it has a memory, and it has a gene or we have culture. So I will predict that there's nothing outside of that three-way triangle that just generates everything. So to understand consciousness, we have to understand it's generating force, and that force generated a living world as well. So uh, by this model, consciousness emerges from this three... This three-pronged three thing. Thing, <laughs> thing, this structure. And um, so let's just back up a little bit and then step into this again. Uh, this original event that precipitates cat the catalyst for life, do we, do we have any idea what, where that comes from? What are the properties, what what's the driver that gets you gets to you there? Cycling. 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 So is that classical or quantum? Uh, that's classical. It's classical. It's classical. But of course quantum mm -hmm. is underlying everything, even classical. Yes. okay. So there is some quantum in it, but we don't need to use that in the lab. So mm -hmm. we have a machine that rotates dishes around, and one dish gets filled with a solution, and then the dish gets dried on the other side. And that simple cycling, which is almost like a day-night cycle or a, high, or a hot spring cycle of filling and drying, can grow RNA or peptides without enzymes. So we found a way that nature could have, could have used, would on, the only way it would have been able to make these long chain polymers in the, in the warm little ponds. That's it, but you have to cycle the ponds to get longer chains, and, and then they start breaking down, you see. When they're in the water, they start what's called hydrolyzing. So you have to resynthesize them constantly. You have to have cycling to keep driving the system, and our bodies are deteriorating constantly. We have all these molecular machines to fix our cells and to then divide cells, to, cells go on, cells die, etc. And one day, we're, we're hydrolyzed, <laughs> you know? That just happens. So, Life is an ever process of staying ahead of, of degradation through hydrolysis and other things. And it's just learned the trick of doing that. So that's it. Uh, so in a sense, I don't think you could have something that we would put the human word consciousness on anything that isn't part of this living world. Because if you don't have the three-way triangle running, all you've got is physics. And all you've got is two-way cycling in physics, no intermediate states. When you have biology of three-way cycling, when you have the nervous system, this is something we are going to propose tomorrow, you have four-way cycling. Why? Because with nerve action, neuronal structure, you can have ability for an organism to predict where it's going to have action. Directed action could be called free will. That's the addition of a fourth phase, which is new in biology and certainly impossible in physics. And then perhaps consciousness is there's a fifth phase that I'll leave for this group to, to name. So that's the overall framework. So consciousness emerges stacked up in the cycling system that keeps adding phases and complexity and this triangle keeps running and running and running. And I, I would challenge anyone in this community to find something that's outside of that that can't be really explained by the three building blocks and by the cycling of phases. Everything can be seen through that lens. Right, that's an interesting challenge, particularly at this conference. Yes. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Even microtubules have well, to follow the... Yes, yeah, Stuart talks about the abilities of a single cell, paramecium, and its ability to understand its environment, to learn. Apparently, it will escape from a glass dropper quicker mm -hmm. each time. It's, if you put mm -hmm. it back in, it finds its way out a little bit quicker every time. And yet it has no brain, has no neurons, mm -hmm. it has, it's the simplest 
structure, we, living structure we have, yeah. it does have microtubules. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that sort of gave him a little bit of a nudge in the direction. In that direction, um, yeah. So, But there is obviously some kind of com computing, I use the word carefully, but interaction going on where the, the uh, paramecium is responding and then having some kind of volition. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be the beginning of that for exactly. Phase. Yeah. Now, obviously, we are multicellular, multi-million, billion cellular mm -hmm. versions, and uh, we're able to sit and have a chat about it. But nonetheless, it seems that one could say that consciousness has already arisen in the paramecium. Mm -hmm. it just, but uh, paramecium's consciousness is clearly nothing like our own. Well, Alan Watts gave this wonderful talk in 1965 about this and talked about the mineral having some kind of really low grade consciousness, you hit it and it rings. And then we're a different level, but it's a continuum. So he could, he could have said, well, we come from, we're just a developed mineral, or a mineral is just a simple version of our consciousness. And that could be kind of close to the truth. Uh, although the challenge is we're probably using the wrong terms. We have to define our terms. Can we use the word consciousness with a paramecium or a mineral? You know, we have to, predicate it and say, well, it would be a simpler such and such. So why don't we just use a different term? Because otherwise people get confused, I think. You know, they'll get confused, well, you know, because the common usage of the word consciousness has never been quite completely clarified. What do we mean by that? Right. There are multiple definitions of consciousness, but I suppose the context it tends to be used here, mm -hmm. for the most part, is a certain sort of property or quality of being. It is that sense of subjective awareness, the feeling of mm. being, mm -hmm. there's something in here. It's Cartesian. I could be deceived as to the true nature of what's around me, but what I know for sure is that there is um, awareness. There is being, there is awareness. Mm -hmm. So perhaps that's as far as we can go. And everything else we might call the contents of consciousness. And I think that if you map that onto this triangle mm -hmm. of a probability engine, massive connection and pattern in memory, and perhaps that this triangle is continuously flowing, you can't actually take a snapshot where there's the contents of coming into my consciousness, there's my consciousness. It's a continuous wave that's going, that, that operates in concert and in parallel. So it's really hard to freeze frame this kind of thing and put the insect in the collection with the pin in it because then there's no information left in the dead insect, really. One of the challenges here is when we're talking about something that is subjective, we, as best as we can, it is subjective. It I is mean, subjective. I have, I, I have subjective, I'm sure you do too. Um, then um, to, um, to try to find how that emerges from matter mm. becomes complex. It's, it's a challenge. You know, mm -hmm. the materialists always have their work cut out because, okay, how do atoms become self-aware? Mm -hmm. What pro property do they have inherently in them that allows that? Now, where in your model does this all start to, the magic take place? I think the magic takes place when environments are created. So there's a professor at Mansfield College in Oxford named John Oldling Smee, good, good English name. Uh, and he wrote a book called Niche Construction Theory. And his, his claim is that it isn't until you get niches, until you get something where biology, even the simplest biology, is making its own world. It, it actually is creating a body. And in our world of the origin of life, that's the progenote world leading to the microbial film. And those are all communities. Individuals can't exist in that world. But it's changing its environment from what it was, the horrible Hadean environment, into this kind of more cozy environment. Like create your living room, your hotel, et cetera, et cetera. So we create environments, and they're all kinds of environments. Humans create environments endlessly. But the environments shape our perceptions. So if we're out in nature and we're, say, a, a person 20,000 years ago, our, our consciousness is going to be completely different than somebody sitting in this hotel. Our awareness is different. So I think it really does come down to what niche are you currently in, were you raised in, what body do you inhabit that creates what is your consciousness. That's probably the best labeling or metric. Where is your niche? And as, as human beings are saying, make more of them. They take different drugs or they, 
you know, go through extreme sports or what, they change their levels. They go into flow states and things like this. And it's all niche dependent. It's all who your mates are, you know, what your family situation is, is going to shift everything. So instead of studying consciousness maybe at the level of an individual, study at the level of environment, rather. Because the individuals are going to shift as soon as they walk out of this hotel and they go to the swimming pool and start swimming. Their whole conscious field and their subjective experience changes. So it's, it's hard to, it's hard to, lay, you know, to pin it onto the individual, really. Yes, I suppose one question to that is if you take, I don't know, early hominids, one asks the question, well, are they conscious? Well, yes, I think we can say, reasonable to say that they were con that their consciousness doesn't resemble ours. They probably don't mm -hmm. have cognition. They're not necessarily chatting about yeah, how chatting. lunch was or the nature of the universe. But I think it's reasonable to say And they have that incredible they were, they were awareness aware. of the bird life around them. Exactly. You know, so, but there is awareness. So let's yeah. say that's our starting point, is there is this fundamental property of awareness. And birds likewise. And Thomas Nagel said, well, what's it like to be a bat? Well, bat, we assume, is aware. Mm. Uh, the rest is all contents. The rest is interpretation, species-specific And it may be that the large bat colony is more aware than the individual bat, because it's a, a huge thing. And it may be that the, the cave that they're in, with the cockroaches at the bottom and the bats hanging in the top, waiting for their horrible deaths, is, an, is a bigger field of consciousness, because it's like a bigger matrix, because those bats aren't separate. We, we make ourselves in separation. Perhaps most of the natural world doesn't exist in the separation that we are in, because we went into thought. We had developed all this capability, and then we developed this weird concept of separateness, which is dangerous for the species and the planet. But the bat consciousness is not separate. Individuals, they move as a field. They, they live and die as a field. Their bodies are recycled as a field, and the babies are born, and they're kind of there just like the microbial world is a field, it is a matrix. And so humans are kind of an anomaly in the living world. So perhaps any organism that's living not in thought, not going down rabbit holes of thought, which we, we do quite a lot in academic settings, uh, but in the present world uh, is in a different place than we are. And they're different, they have different awareness, they have different presence, and they have different consciousness, level of consciousness. That, that we, we can access at times, but we've separated ourselves. And so we're the anomaly, really, in that game. Oh, I think we're definitely the anomaly. We're the anomaly. I'd say, uh, you know, I mean, if you read Daniel Quinn, you, you know, the, the, the trouble starts when we really wake up mm. and realize where, you know, we can run the place. Right. And, uh, and up right. until then, things actually go along quite nicely. You know, humans can, while well, they're still nomads and hunter-gatherers, pretty much it'll work forever. Yeah. But the minute we start to realize, oh, I can make a field and put the cows in and grow some crops and then we can have a war with the neighbors and then it all falls down. Taking your three-pointed model uh, and extrapolating where, what, where are we going? Mm. What's it telling us? What, can we ha what do we have to look forward to? Is it all doom and gloom or uh, we will all be enlightened? I, I think it's a wonderful unveiling. I mean, I think things are just tremendous right now. I mean, for our species, we're not, you know, living next to the pigsty you know, and getting various diseases and dying when we're 38. You know, this is a situation just 300 years ago. I mean, we're in the best time that humans have ever had on this planet. You know, we're, we're converting the planet into our, the Anthropocene, into our own template. Uh, and we have to manage that because we're, it's a big responsibility. So the planet's saying, well, okay, you want to replace all the, the biome over to you, then you have to manage it because we can't adapt fast enough for the changes you're undergoing. But I think that the biosphere will, will masterfully adapt to the changes. Uh, and, and we're incredibly adept at you know, creating new food sources. We're, we're, we've stayed ahead of this thing, um, you know, the green revolution and whatnot. Microelectronics and the computer, this is why I collect vintage computers for the last 30 years. I have you know, hundreds of them now in my barn. It's because it's the Promethean invention. It's, it's the great invention of the last 500 years and the next. And we don't even have an idea of the impact that's going to have on our survivability. It's in every tool. It's in every pocket. It's in every mind. You know, the microprocessor plus software. We haven't a clue where that's taking us. Self-driving cars at the beginning, 
AI, I don't think we'll ever see a true AI because computer architectures aren't aren't set up for for true emergence. So it's a it's a clever set of tools, but it doesn't support emergent phenomena very well. It's what I did my PhD work on to kind of disprove or falsify that you could have emergent phenomena in computing systems. That's why I switched to chemistry to crack this problem of the origin of life. Is says computers are never going to be fast enough, and they're built wrong. They're thin pipes. Like they're thin serial pipes, and nature doesn't work that way. So I switched to chemistry. <laughs> we use the real molecules, can do the walking, you know. Mm. And now here I'm at a consciousness conference, <laughs> and I have no idea why, but <laughs> well, I've, I've got consciousness, two points of my talk tomorrow at the very beginning, and it has a question mark around it. And the second, which should be interesting for this audience, talking about how does this go up to consciousness? Well, if the universe works on two cycles, dualistic cycling, early life works on three cycles, the first body of the first biome, and it just goes through three cycles. The fourth cycle is this idea of the nervous system, and maybe the paramecium is expressing it early on with just chemical signaling or microtubules, no matter what, and it's got a predictive learning ability. For this audience, there's a fifth cycle. What is the fifth element that sets us apart from the paramecium? Because we can probably clearly see the previous that go all the way back to the Big Bang. It's just the addition of, of stages in cycling. This is a new idea, although it may have been written about by somebody else, but there's a fifth. What is the fifth cycle? What is the fifth phase that creates consciousness? And maybe we can crack that. What got you started on this path? Well, when I was 14, I was a kid that lived in his imagination, in imaginal worlds as many of us are. And I was out walking in the sagebrush hills next to my home in Canada, in British Columbia. And I bent down, and there was a mariposa lily coming out of the previously frozen soil. And it had this beauty and this structure to it. And I thought, it came from either a seed or a bulb, something smaller and simpler. How did it know how to do this? to create this structure. And then I stood up and I noticed there were plants doing it everywhere across the valley and I thought, how did all of this learn how to do this? And then I thought, oh, uh, that's an interesting problem to work on for a nerdy kid that doesn't have a computer because there are no computers in our town in 1976. But I had a computery kind of a software brain because uh, I used to design games and things like this. and so. I stood up and I thought, this is a worthy project to work on for my whole life. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work on it all the way through. This is the one that I'm going to work on. And then my system started changing. It's like, oh, I made a commitment, so I made an intention. And so something sort of shot down back. You know, of course, at that point, whatever feeling comes, you go with it. You're 14 years old. Uh, so this thing shot back to me, and I thought, something's happening. Oh. It's a thought experiment. I read about Albert Einstein. At 16, he, he was running alongside a beam of light in a thought experiment. I think he was on a hike as well. It, nobody quite knows, but he used to hike all the time. Uh, and he drank strong coffee, I think, uh, either way. And he worked out special relativity by seeing the compression of the waves, the wave-particle duality. That's where it started. So I thought, oh, I can do that. And so in front of me, in my, eye, my mind's eye, but almost visually, was this seething mass of molecules. And I was about to ask it the question, I figure you can ask this thing a question, is, uh, how did simple molecules organize into the living thing, just on their own, without a guiding hand or a programmer? And before I could ask that question, it asked me a question, saying, figure out how I made a copy of myself. And then my little 14-year-old brain went to, well, if you were like an automobile, you're in a machine, you need a bigger machine to make a copy of a little machine. You need a factory to make automobiles. And this is not possible. And it winked. So it went like this. And 36 years later, I woke up one morning, did my yoga, did my breath work, and I went into a reverie in asking the question of how do we simulate this in the lab. And a, you know, a couple hours later, I had fallen into the pool, and I had become the, the cycling protocell. And I watched all the evolutionary steps. They just kept coming and coming. And as the protocells came up against a barrier, there'd be another innovation, another one, another one. Then they started getting distributed to the pools. And I was very excited about that. It was super clear. It was very technicolor. 
ran upstairs, wrote it out, did the drawing, sent them to Dave Deemer at UCSC, who's my colleague and, and a renowned lipid chemist and really the father of this approach. He's the giant upon which this is built. And he wrote back saying, you found it. You found the, the kinetic trap, the cycle. And then we published that a year and a half later. That was 2013 to 2014. We've been spending a couple of years with our colleagues and they're starting to test parts of this. And we'll have a Scientific American article for the public in August with our Australian colleagues and geologists who discovered the oldest life in a hot spring, which is exactly the weight of evidence coming our way. And so what's fascinating about all this and exciting for me is if somehow that intention when I was 14 has landed us with a potential solution to this wonderful nerdy problem, the bootstrapping, the booting up of life through random writing of code in polymers. It's like a no-brainer type of a thing when you look at it as a nerd. But we're now realizing, wait a minute, we're sitting at the junction point between the beginning of life and the process of evolution. There's another branch that goes into philosophy because if we, we can show that life started as a communal unit of collaborating systems, not competing cells, because that requires too much technology, then the whole world probably is still a communal unit of collaborating systems. And we can rethink the way we do our civilization, our politics, and our economics. So that shoots into philosophy this way. It shoots into complexity science this way, you know, the real gearheads, because we can show a system that does complexify and, and grow open-endedly and we just recently found out, I, I went to a lecture by a physicist at our campus on information in physics, Professor Aguirre, and he was being invested into a new chair funded to investigate how information plays a role in physics. And I realized, oh my goodness, we're actually doing this. We're growing polymers that could carry information through cycling systems in the lab. So that we had a big meeting three weeks ago. And whoa, we're collaborators. We can link down into physics, we can inform physics. A fundamental question in physics is how does physics reify the world? And how far can it go before you have to switch to biology? And biology is a form of physics, but it has these three new properties that Stuart Kaufman would talk about, the adjacent possible and all that wonderful language that he uses. Well, we're now characterizing those properties. So we're tying into physics this way. And then for consciousness, you know, as we talked about earlier, it seems like the origin of life has a channel all the way up through into consciousness. So it's a really nice place to sit because you get to go to all these different meetings and change your slides around for three days because you have to learn the whole meeting. And so if I go to a physics meeting and do this talk, it'll be different. Or an anthropology meeting or you know, a philosophy meeting or complexity science. So I'm, I'm sure in the next 10 years I'll be presenting this model hundreds of times to different groups and hopefully to the, to the public at large, which will happen in Scientific American in August. Great, we're looking forward to that, and uh, I hope everybody watching will uh, check out that issue when it when it's, uh, is released. Yeah. And something about hot springs, we were saying a bit earlier, there's something about the hot spring, uh, that maybe, you know, the origin of life in a hot spring, and, and yet humans just love it, and yeah, primates Yeah, those love monkeys it. in the Hokkaido. Monkeys. Yes, exactly. So, so if you have, or what did the materialist and the spiritist do when they entered the hot spring, they became one ball of nerd woo. Yes. <laughs> because they just soaked in, fell in love with each other, and it was all fine. It's all fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's all fine in the hot spring. It's and all now we know why. And, <laughs> and where it all started. Human beings evolved for yeah. millions of years in order to invent the jacuzzi, mm -hmm. to spread these jacuzzis all over the planet uh, in order to uh, raise our consciousness by lowering it, <laughs> <laughs> by relaxing. <laughs> That's all it took. <laughs> That's all it took. We have to go back to the hot springs, not the caves. Well, the caves no, are all right. right. It's the hot springs. It's That's the, the key springs. to everything. The cave is a total diversion. Yeah, the right. cave, we just did cave art. We argued about who had on which part of the cave, but the hot spring, we come together. Mm. Bruce, thank you very much for your uh, time and for uh, this. Uh, this is fascinating. Um, thank you. I hope you enjoy your uh, plenary tomorrow with uh, Deepak and, and Stuart. It's, um, and I hope you've had fun listening to some oh, of the other been, very different points of view here. It's been marvelous here. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is a lot of fun. That's why we keep coming back. And I hope you will too. It's very nice to meet you. Thank and you. thanks again. Thank you very right. much. That's yeah. Bruce Damer.
Thanks for listening to this fresh set of new ideas. And tune in next episode for the full plenary talk I presented on June 10th, 2017. Oh, and one more thing. A special personal note. After 41 years of dreaming and working on this most fascinating problem of how molecules assembled into the living world, our scenario appeared in this month's, that's August 2017, issue of Scientific American. It was also the cover story. Along with the report of the discovery of the oldest evidence for life on land by Martin Van Krenendonk and Tara Jokic, Dave Diemer and my cycling scenario and landscape are depicted and described as the other centerpiece of the article. It's a dream come true for a teenager who, back in Kamloops, B.C., Canada, loved looking through Scientific American articles of all sorts, inspiring him to eventually pursue a career in science. Thanks go out to Nick Day and his crew for the audio for this interview. Find the full video of both the interview and the talk on the page for this episode, number 57, at www.levityzone.org.